The following film is based on the book Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, published by Harper and Row. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Richard Foster. Thank you so much. St. Augustine said, the Christian should be an alleluia from head to foot. Now, in this final session, we want to focus on the Christian discipline of celebration. But first, let's see how all of the corporate disciplines interrelate. You see, the spiritual disciplines have a corporate side to them. If we speak of the inward and outward disciplines alone, we will be saying something false. No religion in the world is committed to to community like Christianity. A Buddhist, for example, can go to the temple in complete isolation from other human beings. But for the Christian, worship is an intently corporate experience. We don't sing or pray or receive the Lord's Supper in isolation. No, no, no. We do it together. We need each other. We are absolutely interdependent. Our doctrine of the church demands a corporate witness. We are the body of Christ together. Paul compared our interconnectedness to the human body. The eye can't say to the foot, I don't need you. And the foot can't tell the eye to bug off. I mean, now the foot could have a lot to complain about. I mean, you know, that eye gets all the fun. Gets to see colors, mountains, trees, people, everything. And here I am in this smelly old shoe. It's hot, dark, dusty, and all I ever get's athlete's foot. <laughs> but you see, if we were just one gigantic eye, we would not have a functioning body. The eye needs the foot, and the foot needs the eye. If we were all feet, we might be able to get somewhere, but we'd never know it. <laughs> we would be bumping and banging into everything everywhere. And so you see, we absolutely need each other the most insignificant person in the fellowship is essential to our spiritual growth. And I think that one of the finest descriptions of a community of people working and living under disciplined grace is given to us in the 12th chapter of Romans. Listen to these words of Paul. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Never flag in zeal. Be aglow with the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant 
in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony one with another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Isn't that a beautiful description of a community of people living in disciplined grace? And so the spiritual disciplines have a corporate side. There is confession, worship, guidance, and celebration. Let's look at them briefly. Confession draws us into the divine mystery of redemption. At the heart of God is the desire to forgive and to give. And that's precisely why God set in motion the entire redemptive process that culminated in the cross and was confirmed in the resurrection. You see, on the cross, Jesus accomplished His highest, most holy work. He took into Himself all of the sorrows, all of the hurts, all of the angers, all of the evils of humankind in order to set us free. That's why Jesus refused the customary painkiller. He wanted His mind to be completely alert for this greatest work He had to do. Some people think that when Jesus shouted out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That, that it was a moment of weakness. Oh, no, no, no. They missed the whole point. It was his moment of greatest triumph, for he had become so identified with human sin that God had to turn his back upon his own son. Stretching all the way back to the very first act of disobedience in the garden, Jesus Christ drew into himself all of the violence and anger and, and bitterness and hurt and fear and he brought it in and redeemed it all. But not only that, he took all of those who were living around him, those who were watching him die, and those who were living at that time, and he brought into his own body their sin, their hurt, their fear, their violence, and he redeemed it. But there's even more. Because Jesus Christ lives in the eternal now, he was able to stretch forward into human history uh, up to our time and to the end of time as we know it and bring into himself and to redeem all of the sin and violence of all humankind. Now, just to get some idea of what that might look like, let's take one tiny little pinpoint in human history. When the atomic bomb fell on Hiroshima, in some mysterious way, Jesus Christ on the cross took into Himself all of the screams of that event. And then, as He felt the last twinges of evil pass through Him and into the arms of the Father, He was able to announce in victory, It is finished. It was more than that His life was finished, but that this great work of redemption was finished. It is finished. Now that's what makes confession possible. I spoke once on tragedy. After the service, a middle-aged fellow came up. He was obviously a visitor. He was kind of a tough-looking sort of fellow, but he had tears in his eyes, and he said, I want to speak with you sometime. And I said, sure. Now I set an appointment to go see him on a Thursday night. Oh, I was so serious in those days. <laughs> Very rigid. I, I had this system I wanted to lay on him. You know, I was going to make him a Christian. <laughs> and uh, so I went there. But I couldn't get a word in edgewise. He began to pour out to me his hurt and his need. And uh, uh, he... he, he for 26 years, had lived in depression, the deep heaviness upon him. He would wake up in the middle of the night screaming 
and in a cold sweat. And he told me how that 26 years ago, that would put it in World War II at that time, he was a ranger in Italy. He was sent out on a mission in charge of 33 men. They got pinned down by the enemy. And all day long he prayed desperately that somehow God would get them out of there. But it wasn't to be. He had to send his men out two by two and watch them get killed. Until finally in the early hours of the morning, he was able to escape with six men. Four of them seriously wounded. All he had was a little flesh wound. He told me that he became an atheist out of that experience. Mad at God, full of bitterness, anger, guilt. I listened to that story and I said to him, Don't you know that Jesus Christ, God's Son, can come in and heal that old bitter memory and set you free? He didn't know 26 years. I just slipped over on the couch beside him and I put my hand on his shoulder. <laughs> that was my shy way of the laying on of hands. <laughs> and I prayed a childlike little prayer. I didn't know how else to do it. I, I, it was the first time I'd ever tried it. I just asked the Lord Jesus, who lives in the eternal now, to go back those 26 years and to walk through that day with that man and to let him know that he was there, that he loved him, that he cared, and to draw out the hurt and the anger and the bitterness and the guilt and, and to set him free. You know, I just thought of it. I said, Lord, I'd so appreciate it if one of the evidences of this healing work will be that he'll be able to sleep all night long. Amen. Well, we talked back and forth for a while. After about a half an hour, he turned to his wife and he said, You know, honey, I feel good. I haven't said that for 26 years, have I? She said, no, you haven't. I thought, hmm? <laughs> but I didn't say anything. That was on a Thursday night. Sunday morning, here was this man. Second time in 26 years he had been in a church house. He walked down the aisle. He was three feet off the ground. He got a hold of me, lifted me up off the ground. He said, I have slept all night long for three nights straight. And every morning I would wake up with a hymn on my mind. Isn't that wonderful? I wanted to say, God, what are you doing? I haven't given him the stuff yet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, this man came into saving faith without my system. <laughs> now that was about 12 years ago or so. And though this man has had the normal ups and downs that ordinary human beings have, those old fears, that old depression, has never returned. Never. That's confession. Well, you can see how confession leads us to celebration. I mean, once we're released, once we're set free, celebration is the natural, the spontaneous thing. I mean, the hard thing would be not to celebrate. And then there's worship. Worship. The heart and soul of worship is the confession that Jesus Christ is alive and here to teach His people Himself. And He is among us in all of His offices. He is our priest to forgive us, our prophet to teach us, and our king to rule us. George Fox said, Meet together in the name of Jesus. He is your prophet shepherd, your bishop, your priest in the midst of you to quicken you and to sanctify you and to feed you with life and to quicken you with life. You see, Christ frees us from the consequences of sin and gives us power to love above the dominion of sin. And in worship, Christ is among us, wooing and winning, teaching and forgiving, rebuking and challenging. And in our worship, we can join with that heavenly choir of revelation and sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and glory and honor and blessing. And when we experience Him among us, worship 
comes alive. I was a speaker once at a college weekend retreat in the High Sierras. No, oh, it was a wonderful time, especially that first Friday evening. I never got a chance to speak, and I suppose for some people that was the most wonderful part of it. <laughs> but uh, as we gathered together, different ones all over began to spontaneously lead out in, in, in great hymns uh, of worship and adoration and praise to God. Oh, it was a wonderful experience. I suppose it lasted for an hour or more. And then, without any prompting or instruction, uh, different ones would just begin to break down, weeping and, and making confession. Individuals would get up from different places and go over to others and quietly make confession or share some other need, and they'd be reconciled. And, and, and while that happened, the rest of us would, would sit reverently, perhaps singing a hymn prayerfully or, or just being quiet. And I suppose that happened and went on for another hour or so. And then it seemed that the whole atmosphere of the meeting changed again as different ones began to lead out into songs of, of praise and adoration and thanksgiving and joy. I mean, there, were, there was festivity. There was, there was a sense of dance and of, and of celebration and, and of rapture almost. I guess I'd say that those were three of the most precious hours of worship that I have ever known. Well, you can see how worship draws us into celebration. You see, God is hunting worshipers. Jesus tells us that the Father is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. You see, God's put the advertisements out. Y'all come, anybody who's willing to worship in spirit and in truth. He's hunting them out like the hound of heaven. He's after us to win us, to woo us, to, to, to clobber us with his love. Uh, uh, like the, the father of the prodigal who sees his son a long way off, he runs out to welcome him back. And that's what God's doing for us, and that's why we can sing that little chorus, Set my spirit free that I may worship thee. Set my spirit free that I may praise thy name. Let all bondage go and let redemption flow. Set my spirit free to worship thee. William Temple said, to worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, to devote the will to the purpose of God. Worship is the highest, holiest work we are given. Guidance is also among the corporate disciplines. In our day, heaven and earth are on tiptoe waiting for the emerging of a spirit-led, spirit-intoxicated, spirit-empowered people. But such a people will not emerge until there is among us a deeper, more profound experience of an Emmanuel of the Spirit, God with us, a knowledge that in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus has come to guide His people Himself, an experience of His leading that is as definite and as immediate as the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. But the knowledge of the direct, active, immediate leading of the Spirit upon the individual will not be sufficient. Individual guidance must yield to corporate guidance. There must also come the experience of the direct, active, immediate leading of the Spirit together. Now, I don't mean corporate guidance primarily in an organizational sense, but in an organic, functional sense. God, you remember, led the children of Israel, out of the house of bondage as a people. I mean, this was not a group of individuals that just be, happened to be going in the same direction. They were under the theocratic rule of God. His brooding presence covered them with an amazing immediacy. 
The people, however, soon found out that God's unmediated presence is very dangerous. And so they said to Moses, 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 you speak to us. Let not God speak to us lest we die. Now, that was the beginning of the great line of the prophets and judges, Moses being the first. But it was a step away from this sense of immediacy. And you remember then how that under Samuel, the people clamored for a king, and this distressed Samuel a great deal. But God said to him, don't be upset, Samuel. They are not rejecting you. They are rejecting me from being king over them. You see, they had turned away from the theocratic rule of God. Give us a king. Give us a ruler. Give us a mediator. Give us a priest. Give us a pastor. Give us a go-between. That way we can maintain religious respectability without the risk. And you don't have to look at contemporary Christianity for very long to realize that it is saturated by the religion of the mediator. But you see, when Jesus came, he taught us how to live under God's rule. He showed the disciples what it meant to live responsive to the voice of the Father. He taught them that they too could hear the heaven-sent voice and most clearly when they are together. If two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He taught them that he was the good shepherd and that his sheep could hear his voice. And so in the discipline of guidance, we are learning together to listen to the Lord, together to discern His voice, together to obey His will. Confession, worship, guidance. You see how they all lead to celebration. Now, let's focus our attention on the spiritual discipline of celebration itself. Celebration is so central to all the spiritual disciplines. I like to think of it as the motor for the whole system. I mean, without celebration, the disciplines are dry, dull, dusty stuff. There is nothing that can kill like a joyless spirituality. You remember that Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Joy is what makes us strong, and we won't stay at anything very long without joy. I mean, we might be able to begin our piano lessons by dint of will, but we won't keep at it without joy. In fact, the only reason we start is because we know that the end result is joy. And when you see someone playing a magnificent concerto with beauty and ease, you can just see the joy on their face. It is the joy of ingrained habit patterns. Now, you see, that's what we want. Now, <laughs> I'm not free to enjoy playing the piano. If I were to go over there and try to play something on the piano, it would be misery for me to play it, and it would be misery for you to hear it. <laughs> but now for, for Rubenstein, it's joy, because that music is in his hands, it's in his head, it's, it's in the ingrained habit structure of who he is, and that's when the joy comes. In fact, you remember that joy is listed among the fruit of the Spirit. And whenever we master the spiritual life, we find joy flowing through it all. Joy makes us strong. But now, how do we get onto this path of joyous celebration? The old hymn tells us that there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You see, there is no blessedness equal to the blessedness of obedience. Without obedience, joy is hollow and artificial. Joy comes through obedience to Christ and results from obedience to Christ. 
To elicit genuine celebration, obedience must work its way into the ordinary fabric of our daily lives. Without that, our celebrating carries a hollow sound. For example, some people live in such a way at home that it is virtually impossible to have any kind of happiness at all. But then they go to church and sing songs and pray with vigor, hoping that somehow God will give them an infusion of joy to make it through the day. They're looking for some kind of heavenly transfusion that will bypass the misery of their daily lives and give them joy. But God's desire is not to bypass the misery, but to transform it. There's something terribly sad about people who run from church to church trying to get an injection of the joy of the Lord. See, joy is not found in singing jazzy songs or getting with the right kind of group or, or even exercising the gifts of the Spirit. Joy is found in obedience. When the power that is in Christ reaches into our work and into our play and redeems those things, then there will be joy where once there was mourning. To overlook this is to miss the meaning of the incarnation. And that's why celebration stands at the end of our study. Joy is the end result of the spiritual disciplines having functioned in our lives. God brings about the transformation of our lives through the disciplines and not until there is a transforming work within us do we know genuine joy. You see, we try to often to bring people into joy too quickly. You know, we pump people up with joy when in reality there is nothing in their lives to be joyful about. God has not broken in to the routine experiences of daily life. Celebration comes when the common ventures of life have been redeemed. Oh, it is so important to avoid the kind of celebrations that really celebrate nothing. Worse yet is to pretend to celebrate when the spirit of celebration is not in us. Our children watch us bless the food and promptly proceed to gripe about it. Blessings that are not blessings. And one of the things that nearly destroys children is to be forced to be grateful when they are not grateful. When we pretend an air of celebration, our inward spirit is put into contradiction. Now, what are the benefits of celebration? Well, there are many. But far and away the most important is that it saves us from taking ourselves too seriously. This is a desperately needed grace for everyone who is concerned about the spiritual disciplines. You see, it is an occupational hazard of devout folk to become stuffy bores. <laughs> and we should never allow that to happen. Of all people, we're to be the most free, the most alive, the most interesting. Celebration adds a note of gaiety, festivity, hilarity to our lives. After all, Jesus rejoiced so full in life that he was accused of being a wine-bibber and a glutton. And many of us lead such sour lives that that would be the last thing we could be accused of. <laughs> now, I'm not recommending a periodic romp in sin, <laughs> but I am suggesting that we need deeper, more earthy experiences of exhilaration. It's healing and refreshing to cultivate a wide appreciation for life. Our spirit can get weary with straining after God, just like our body can become weary from overwork. Celebration allows us to relax and enjoy the good things of the earth. Celebration gives us perspective. We can laugh at ourselves. We can come to see that the causes we champion are not nearly so important as we might think. In celebration, the high and the mighty gain their balance, and the weak and the lowly receive new stature. Who can be high or low at the festival of God? Together, the rich and the poor, the powerful and the powerless, 
all celebrate the glory and wonder of God. There is no leveler of caste systems like festivity. Now, let's turn our attention to the really important question of how we go about practicing the discipline of celebration. You see, it is not enough just to talk about it. We must have wineskins which will embody it. In the Middle Ages, there was a holiday known as the Feast of Fools. This was the time when all sacred cows of the day could be safely laughed at and mocked. Subordinates could mimic and ridicule their superiors. Political leaders were lampooned. The idea was to use festivity as a leveler of caste systems. Now, we can do, of course, without the excessive debauchery that often accompanied those festivals, but we do need wineskins for festivity. And let me suggest a few possibilities for enfleshing the spiritual discipline of celebration. First, let's creatively discover festivals of worship. Festivals of worship. You remember in the Old Testament, there was the Feast of First Fruits which was basically a festival of thanksgiving. There was the feast of Passover with its attempt to rehearse the mighty deeds of God, how that with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God led His children out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage. There was Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, as a festival of confession. There was the Feast of Lights, commonly known as Hanukkah, which was instituted during the intertestamental period and had celebration as its central objective. Well, why not Christian festivals? Why not set up whole days given over to rejoicing to God's goodness? You remember the old camp meetings of the early pioneer days and, and the Bush Arbor meetings of the South? Well, these were basically festivals of worship, and we can do the same thing as individual congregations and as larger groupings of people. Use choirs, uh, dancing, pageantry, plays, skits, singing, and many, many other kinds of things. Just a few weeks ago, we were in a small community that put together an old-fashioned melodrama, or as our son Nathan calls it, a boo-hiss play. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it had an original script and hometown actors, and I tell you, it was a hilarious evening. Uh, our church fellowship in Oregon once decided to have a celebration night in appreciation of the pastors. Every family made a homemade card. Uh, various groups prepared skits and plays and readings and jokes. I was one of those pastors, and they roasted me good. But I want to tell you, it was a wonderful night. I mean, why do we wait until the pastor leaves to throw an appreciation party? <laughs> Second, let's capture the festivals of our culture for Christ and His kingdom. Why allow Halloween to be a pagan holiday in commemoration of the powers of darkness? Why not fill the house or church with light, sing and celebrate the victory of Christ over darkness? Let the children and adults dress up as biblical characters or as some of the saints throughout the centuries. Or thanksgiving. How about making thanksgiving a time of really giving thanks? I mean, devise ways to rehearse the goodness of God that are more creative than watching a football game on television. And what a great celebration we could make of Christmas. It doesn't have to have all the crass commercialism connected to it if we don't want it to be that way. Of course the giving of gifts is a great thing, but there are many kinds of gifts that we can give. Some years ago, our youngest son Nathan uh, was just learning to play the piano at this time, and he decided that his Christmas present to every member of the family would be a piece on the piano. And so he'd write that out on a slip of paper, and he would wrap it up in a box. And oh, he'd get all kinds of boxes. Great big box. <laughs> and, he, and he'd wrap it up. And he'd have great fun trying to get us to guess what kind of present is in this box. And then when Christmas came, and we opened it, there was this note that he would play a piece. And he'd jump up on the piano bench and play that piece on the piano. Do you know that was one of the greatest 
presence I have ever received. How fun. How delightful. Maybe you can think of ways to make New Year's a really celebrative event, finding ways to rehearse the goodness of God in the past year and to make high, holy resolves for the future. Make Easter a great celebration. Forget the spring style show and celebrate the power of the resurrection. Make family Easter plays. Perform them for your friends and neighbors. Revive the old May Day celebrations. Go pick flowers and deliver them to your neighbors and friends. Rejoice in the beauty and color and variety everywhere. Third, let's make up our own occasions for celebration. They can be annual celebrations like vacations. Vacations don't need to cost an arm and a leg to be meaningful. We don't have to see the whole world. The idea is to break out of our normal work routine in order to give special attention to one another and to enjoy God's good creation. There are times of, of playing games in the evening, of, of roasting marshmallows around the fire, of popping popcorn and talking and laughing and putting puzzles together. In other words, we're investing time in one another, believing that we count with each other and that that is a good investment of our time and energy. Carolyn and I have particular times when we go away just to renew our marriage. Now these aren't times to visit Aunt Susie or to see the world. They're times to really work on our marriage relationship. We schedule them way ahead just like you would any important matter. Now a lot of good has come from those experiences. And in fact in many ways, in many ways, I think we would credit the strength of our marriage to those periodic times of going away just to renew our love for each other. And in a culture that places virtually no value whatsoever upon staying together in marriage, such times as these can be a grand celebration of God's graciousness to us and of our love for each other. Well, I know that you can find hundreds of other ways to celebrate. And I'm sure that many of you already do far more than I've mentioned here. But the idea is to learn that laughing and singing and joy and celebration is an integral part of the spiritual life. In Revelation chapter 5, we have that marvelous scene of the throne of God with the living creatures and the elders and the angels numbering myriads upon myriads, as John puts it. And they're all shouting out at the top of their lungs, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Worthy is the Lamb. Now, dear friends, we praise God we worship Christ. We celebrate His power and love, not because it tickles our fancy, not because it gives us spiritual goosebumps, but because He's worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Celebration, praise, adoration. These things aren't optional for the believer. They are categorical imperatives. Give to the Lord the glory do His name, said the psalmist. You see, we don't tack celebration onto the Christian life as you would a tape deck onto a car. Oh, no, no, no. It's more like the engine. Without the engine, you don't have a functioning car. Without celebration, you don't have a functioning believer. You need it. I need it. We can't get on without it. And the great challenge is to discover beautiful, creative ways to allow it to happen. Oh, you've been so good in these sessions together. And, and I'd like to close this session with a little experience of celebration. Now, I've got some friends in the wings that are going to help me in just a minute. But first, I'd like your help. I, I want to share a brief litany. And at the appropriate moment, I would like you to shout out the word hallelujah. Now, I don't want you to sing it. I don't want you to say it. I want this to be a high, holy shout. 
Okay? Here goes. Jesus Christ, God's Son, became flesh. Hallelujah. He lived among us in holiness and without sin. Hallelujah. He healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, and proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. He died on the cross for your sin and for mine. Hallelujah. He conquered sin, death, and hell. Hallelujah. He rose from the dead victorious. Hallelujah. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Hallelujah. He is coming again. Hallelujah. He will reign forever and ever as King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> well, we've come to the end of this series, but only the beginning of our journey. We've seen how meditation heightens our spiritual sensitivity, how fasting focuses our lives, how study gives us perception, and how prayer ushers us into the presence of God. Solitude allows us to be genuinely present with people when we are with them. Through submission, we can live with them without manipulation. Through service, we can be a blessing to them. And through simplicity, we can live with them in integrity. Confession frees us from ourselves and allows us to enter into worship. And worship opens the doors onto guidance. And all the disciplines freely exercised brings forth the doxology of celebration. The classical disciplines of the spiritual life beckon us to the Himalayas of the Spirit. We can step out in confidence with our guide who has blazed the trail before us and conquered the highest peak. There will be times of discouragement, sure. The heights where we wish we were 
seems so distant, and we can become frustrated by our seemingly endless wanderings in the foothills. But if we'll glance back, we'll see progress has been made, and in that we can be glad. You remember that the Apostle Paul knew that he had many heights yet to conquer. But r rather than uh, discourage him, it challenged him to press on to the mark, to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That same challenge is ours today. And, O oh Lord, give us the strength, the compassion, the power to meet that challenge. Amen. Thank you for coming. Right.